So we have a really great turnout today. We have um, 67 people with us here on Zoom, and we have a number of additional people joining us on Facebook Live. So 22 questions as of right now. I'm just going to plug right through them as I always do. I'm about five minutes over on the presentation, but I think we should be able to get through these questions in the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes. Okay, first question is from a homeowner. Um, this The homeowners are aware that friends and family of board and management have been both hired for pay and appointed to unpaid committee positions of leadership to maintain power and control. When we bring it up for discussion, the board president and general manager claim it's a human resources privacy issue that they cannot discuss. The Arizona Department of Real Estate requires homeowners to try to resolve issues on their own before requesting a $500 hearing through their ADRE process. A community is 55 plus and people are on tight budgets. Is there free assistance available to us? Um, well, just a couple points. So, you know, having friends and family members being hired to, you know, to do positions at the association or I guess as employees or independent contractors, that's a no-no. Um, I mean, even if they were doing that, it should have been in the open board meeting minutes that this is happening. Um, and it's a bad idea, regardless. Um, but so does the Department of Real Estate offer any sort of financial assistance for people who are on tight budgets? If you want to go to the ADRE process and file a petition against your association regarding these issues. Um, you know, I'm not aware of them waiving the fee, but you could contact them and ask if there's any sort of a special program that they have. I know that um, in Superior Court, there is a way that you can get that filing fee waived, but I'm not aware of anything in the Arizona Department of Real Estate, but you can call them. Um, one way that you could kind of spread around the expense on the hearing, the $500 you know, filing fee cost for the petition would be to get you know, 20 residents to chip in to um, you know, pay that filing fee and then it would lower the cost. Um, one of you would have to be the figurehead you know, filing it in your name, but you could maybe spread the cost by you know, doing it that way. Okay, next question. I am the current president of our board with my term concluding in March of this year. The gadfly in our community was president for many years and was asked to leave some years ago due to an assault of an owner. Can you give me some guidance on how to handle this issue should he decide as an owner to again run for the board? What is the correct manner to handle this? Okay, well, if, you know, I, I'm not familiar with the prior circumstances, but obviously that's concerning that a board member potentially assaulted an owner. So we have a great cheat sheet called um, the Code of Conduct for Board Members that um, you can find on our website at mulcahylawfirm.com. If this particular owner is elected to the board, you should try to have the board sign the Code of Conduct so that everybody agrees to act professionally and respectfully, et cetera. Um, you may want to get your attorney involved if this board member gets elected and have the attorney have a phone conversation with the director to talk about fiduciary responsibilities and reminding the director that the director needs to behave in a professional and business-like manner in all dealings as a board member. Next question is from an owner. We are interested in hosting a short-term rental in our guest house. Um, let's see, I, sorry, I just lost my little position here with the questions. I'm going to go back to that. Um, let's see. Okay, so, however, this is language in our, this is the language in our CCNRs. So, I have an owner who wants to short term rental their guest house. Rental of any guest house is prohibited. The occupancy thereof shall be limited to members of the owner's family, guests, or servants. This shall not be construed as preventing the leasing of a single family dwelling. Our question is, does the ARS provide any exception for short-term rentals as opposed to rental, which would supersede the CCNR above? So short answer would be your CCNR is control here. Um, and you would not be able to rent out your guest house as a short-term rental. In your association, according to the language that you provided to me, um, you can only rent out the entire, you know, the single family dwelling. And it specifically says you cannot rent out the guest house. So um, Arizona law doesn't, you know, have any exception on this. You cannot rent your guest house as a short-term rental. 
Okay, next question. The a city of Peoria has adopted new rental property requirements. Being in Peoria, can our HOA adopt these same requirements and expect rental property owners to abide by them or be fined according to our policies? Um, that's a really good question. You know, with the new legislation, I always love to hear the questions I learned too from teaching these classes. Um, you know, my feeling is that the city of Peoria, um, they they will enforce that ordinance. If the board wants to, you know, have similar requirements, um, you're going to need to amend your CCNRs to include those requirements. It's probably not necessary because the city of Peoria is going to be doing all the work for you. And if you find out that the owner, the landlord is not complying with the city's ordinances and requirements on short-term rentals, you certainly can go to the city and make a complaint um, with code enforcement or with whatever department is going to be enforcing those new ordinances. Next question, what if the president doesn't follow through on enforcement for short-term rentals, meaning like levying fines, which was approved by the association's general counsel or attorney? I believe the president has a personal interest in this issue. So what to do if we have a board that's not following through on short-term rental issues? Well, I think as a homeowner, you should express concern by writing a letter to the board, um, asking them to enforce it. Um, you know, I don't know what was approved by your attorney, um, but as a homeowner, you have the right to, and I don't know if these restrictions are in the CCNRs, but I would start out by writing a letter attend a board meeting, talk about it with the full board. If they continue if they to not enforce whatever section, you know, in the short-term rental provisions that they're not that they're not enforcing, you can go to the Arizona Department of Real Estate, file a petition, you can file a lawsuit, you can get an attorney to write a letter to the board. These are all remedies that you have to make the association enforce the short-term rental um, requirements. Question number six. Our association documents require painting of homes every 10 years. The colors were decided 20 years ago. If the HOA decided to upgrade colors to new colors, how would the association deal with those who just recently painted their homes to meet the current color? So anytime you're doing like a paint conversion in an association, you have to recognize that there is going to be a time period where you know, there's going to be the old paint colors and the new paint colors, and there's going to have to be a transition. Um, so if somebody has recently painted their home, one of the old colors, of course, you cannot make them repaint it, the new color, until their home needs to be repainted, you know, due to wear and tear in the future. Okay, next question, number seven, um, the structure of our HOA is there's a board. There's a general manager and an HR director who works in the administrative area with the general manager. Question, are there any laws or legality around nepotism, specifically persons serving on a board related to each other or working for the HOA, or is it just an ethical issue? Where would these things be stated in governing documents, if at all? Okay, so we have two questions on this today, which is kind of crazy. Um, it's a not a question that we, I mean, I hear it, but it's usually just a couple times a year. I hear it the same day in one of these classes. It's unusual. Okay, so um, basically, here's my opinion on this. If you're serving on your board, do not hire your family, your relatives, your friends to be paid employees of the association. That is a horrible idea. Um, for many reasons. Um, number one, it could be seen as a conflict of interest, not as it's defined under the Condiment Act and the Planned Communities Act, but just in general, that you might be um, engaging in some form of self-dealing, which you know would be a breach of your fiduciary responsibility to the community. Um, so bad idea all around to do this. Um, you know, are there any laws or legality around nepotism? So having a person serving on the board and working for the HOA, or is it just an ethical issue? So it's kind of unusual. The Condominium and the Plan Communities Act talk about this exact circumstance where you have in somebody serving on the board. They It doesn't say they can't do this. It says that if they are going to hire you know, like a relative to work for the association, that they have to disclose in an open board meeting that they're doing this and that they can still vote on it. Now, obviously that's way too lenient in my opinion. 
And I think this should be avoided at all costs. So look in the governing documents. Does it say anything on this? I doubt it will. Um, look at the Condominium Act and the Planned Communities Act where it talks about this conflict of interest thing and disclosing before um, you would hire a relative um, to work for the association while you're serving on the board. Um, you know, there's a section in that section right there. Personally, I, you know, my opinion as a legal counsel for the association is this should be admitted at all costs and it's a potential breach of fiduciary duty under the Arizona Nonprofit Corporation Act. Okay, question number eight. We have a number of units owned by a trust. The John and Jane Doe Revocable or Irrevocable Trust. The trustees include the resident's children. Are these children's trustees considered members of the association? Can these children's trustees vote and run for the board of directors as members? So what I would do if I were looking at this question is I would look at um, what the requirements are to run for the board um, and to be a board member. And I would, you know, typically it'll say you have to be a record owner. Um, and it may mention something about, or an officer or director of a corporation or a member of an LLC. Sometimes it will also expand it to trustee of a trust. Um, and, and more likely than not, depending on how, you know, the trust is set up, these children, if they are trustees, will be able to run for the board. Okay, so next question. Um, this looks like a long one, so I'm going to try to summarize it. Um, okay, we have proposed new CCNRs that read, so these are proposed, so I guess they haven't been filed. Upon the transfer of title to a lot or at the close of escrow, whichever occurs first, a transfer fee in an amount set by resolution of the board may be due and owing to the association. Such transfer fee will contribute to the association's working capital fund for the maintenance, repair, reconstructions, and replacement of improvements. Um, assessment will become part of the assessment lien on the lot and collectible in the same manner as assessments. Okay, so the question is, will the board resolution that set the transfer fee need to be recorded? Do you think that this is a good idea to have the transfer fee undefined in the CCNRs? So, um, well, number one, the board resolution isn't enough to implement this transfer fee. It has to be an actual amendment to your CCNRs where owners vote on it. Looking at the language of your proposed transfer fee, I don't have a problem with the language being undefined, meaning how much the transfer fee will be. I don't have a problem with board determining that, but the rest of the language of that, you know, I guess the board resolution, um, it needs to be updated to make sure it complies with the transfer fee statute. And I don't think it does based upon the short little area that you gave me. Um, so first, a board resolution isn't enough. A board resolution recorded isn't enough. You have to amend the CCNRs. And I am okay with it being undefined, although you know, you're know you going to need the members to vote to approve this. And that may scare members if it's undefined, meaning that the board can make it whatever they want and it could get really high. So if you want to get the votes of the membership, you may want to say, pick a number and then say anything over that number is going to require 51% approval of the membership or something like that. Okay, next question. To date, the HOA has never charged or used the transfer fee. Our 2004 transfer fee section does not state what the transfer fees are collected for and how the funds will be used. The HOA combines all asset. The working capital reserve fund is not held in a single fund. I want to know if our transfer fee is collectible and enforceable. It depends. I'm going to really, I need to look at the, before I could answer on this, I really would need to look at the CCNRs. At first glance, I'd say probably not, um, but it's it's possible. I mean, I have to look at the section. Just because you haven't enforced haven't or used it doesn't mean you can't do it going forward, but I need to look at the language. Um, we probably will need to amend that section to comply with the law. Okay, next question, number 11. Um, is there a legal form or waiver that community volunteers can sign to protect the HOA from damaged suits or possible injury? From time to time, our HOA organizes a community workday. Okay, so this is, I get this question actually frequently when we're in um, high traffic times in the association, right, where we have a lot of boots on the ground, so to speak, and uh, board members, 
are looking for volunteers to paint the curbs red and to you know do different things. So is there a waiver that we can have volunteers sign that's going to be, you know, protects the association from damage suits or possible injury? Short answer, yes, we have a waiver that we give to our clients. Um, but the longer answer is the waiver may not adequately protect you um, in the event that somebody gets injured when they're volunteering, you know, to do whatever, paint the curbs or change light bulbs or whatever. So yes, it's, you know, something that you can do. It's a deterrent for being sued. Um, in conjunction with that, you know, don't have these volunteers jackhammering the pool or climbing up on the roof or doing anything that's dangerous. Um, frankly, we really shy away from advising boards to have this whole volunteer system unless it's something really basic and that they're not going to get hurt doing like picking up trash or, you know, something along those lines. Um, but recognize that the waiver isn't going to fully legally protect your association um, if, you know, the, the person gets injured and they go after and sue the association. It's it's honestly not going to do much to protect the association that they've waived their rights to sue you. It may make them think twice before suing you and they may not do it. But if they actually do file the lawsuit, that waiver isn't going to you know provide us any sort of get out of paying something you know, waiver. OK, next question is from one of my most favorite people in in the world. Um, a family member who serves on a board in, in Arizona. So great to see you here today. Hope to see you again soon. Um, sorry, our Packers lost. Um, can HOAs find owners who illegally park cars and trucks on their front lawns when this is not allowed by the CCNRs? Do they have to send notice first? Can we find the second issue? CCNRs allow for fines. Okay, so we have a great cheat sheet that we're going to be sharing with you on Zoom. You can also find it on our website called cheat sheet for enforcement of governing documents. So short answer, if owners are illegally parking their cars or trucks on their front lawns, and that's a violation of your CCNRs, you bet you can find them for that violation. I'd start out with a courtesy reminder letter. I would escalate it to a fine letter. Remember, if you're fining the owner and your management companies can have the letters already, you know, teed up, so that they comply with the law. But just as a refresher, you have to set up the fine right. So you have to give them notice of the violation, an opportunity to be heard. So they have to have an, after they get the violation, there has to be a time period where they can write back to the board with their position on this or email back the board or the management company with what their position is on that. And then the third step is to actually levy the fine. So it's, you have to set it up right. So send the violation letter, wait the time period for them to respond. And that's all set up in the letter and then send a second letter levying the fine. Um, if they continue, like let's say that they you levy the fine and then they just continue doing this, right? So what you want to do is when you set up that first letter, set it up saying that, okay, if you, you know, we're fining you for doing this on X date, it'd be great if you had pictures and good documentation. And then in that letter, you could also say, and we will fine you for each future violation of this section by parking on your thing X amount. Um, and then they have the opportunity to be heard on the initial violation and any future violations. And then, you know, you send the violation or the, the second letter saying, okay, you're fined for that one time or whatever that you um, parked your truck on the front lawn. And then for each violation that they do that going forward, you just skip right to that last letter saying, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. So if you set up that first letter right and let them know, hey, you know, we're you know, notifying you regarding you doing this. And anytime you do it in the future, there's going to be an X amount of dollar fine. Given the notice of opportunity to be heard, then you're just setting yourself up so you don't have to start over each time you have this same violation by the same owner. Um, so short answer is yes, you do have to send notice before you find you have to give an opportunity to be heard. And if you set it up right, you can just skip right to that second letter and find them for each time going forward. Okay, now we're up to 27 questions. We're on question number 13. We have a resident that has their casita and home on VRBO and Airbnb. Short-term rentals are against the CCNRs. He has received notice and is now being fined. However, refuses to pull the listing. Does our HOA have any legal actions we can take against the homeowner? Uh, absolutely. 
I would send VRBO and Airbnb a letter immediately telling them that um, the online posting that they have on their company's website is contrary to Arizona law and that they may be named as a defendant in a lawsuit. Um, that would be one way to handle it. I would also have your legal counsel reach out to this particular author and go through that whole process that we talked about today, um, showing them the violation, telling them we're going to file a lawsuit to collect on the fines and to get them to stop doing this and that they're going to have to pay all of my legal fees for doing that. Um, I would two-prong approach it that way. Um, I would go to VRBO directly and Airbnb. We've written letters like that before. So contact our firm. We can help you with that. And also um, have your attorney send a, you know, respond to them by calling the owner and, and letting them know what's going to happen if they don't stop. Okay, next question, number 14. Our CCNRs state no businesses are allowed. Are short-term rentals legal businesses? So great question. This goes against like every grain of you know, like what we would think would be right. So of course, short-term rentals are businesses, but there's an exception under Arizona law that allows owners to, you know, rent their properties out unless the CCNRs prohibit or restrict or limit rentals. So yes, it is a business, but we can't use that no business enforcement rule because of that Arizona law. Okay, question number 15, the $25 tenant fee, is that pursuant to statute or does it have to be in our CCNRs, bylaws, or rules and regs? Um, that is pursuant to Arizona law. So we can charge that $25 fee each time there's a change in tenancy um, under Arizona law. And that applies to both condominiums and planned communities. Okay, question number 16, regarding the fee to, let's see, regarding the fee to the association for rental. Does the fee apply to short-term tenants that rent more than once? So you can charge a $25 fee for each time for the same tenant. So the only time, so how it works under the statute is, okay, so let's say that you have a landlord and there's a tenant, right, that comes in. You can charge the $25 fee for the term of their lease. If they renew their lease, and that would have to be just like an extension, right? If they renew that lease, we can't charge them for, um, you know, extending that lease, right? We can't charge them the $25. But let's say this tenant comes back maybe every March. Um, you know, you can charge a new $25 fee if they're coming back every March. Or maybe it's a short-term rental one where, you know, they're coming back frequently throughout the year. Um, if it's not being extended, you can charge a new $25 fee. Okay, uh, next question, number 17. Has there been any activity for anyone challenging Callaway versus Calabria that might open up our ability to revise our CCNRs to prohibit or limit short-term rentals at our 67% voting threshold that is in our CCNRs instead of the 100% that um, Callaway versus Calabria established? Okay, first things first, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're getting a good read on the Callaway case. So that case doesn't necessarily say that you can't amend your CCNRs um, without 100% approval. Um, you have to look at what your language in your CCNR says. You have to look at the section that you're amending. You have to look at how foreseeable it is that that section would be amended. There should be analysis of that. It shouldn't just be, you know, black or white that, okay, you can't do anything now because of Callaway. That is not how that case reads. Um, so I just want to make a comment to you here. So you should talk with an attorney that's familiar with Calway versus Calabria case and give you advice about how you potentially can um, still do an amendment and not violate you know, the provisions of that case. Okay, second thing, um, have there been any challenges to Calway? Um, so it takes a while for these cases to work through the system, right? Sometimes up to three years. Um, I'm aware of one case that's already in the system that may further clarify Callaway. Um, there was on this short-term rental issue. There's another case that actually was decided right before Christmas. Um, and it was interesting. It was an amendment case, and the court declined to analyze the short-term rental issue um, because the case was getting bounced on another issue. So um, it's coming. It probably will be in 2023. If I had to forecast, something will happen, some sort of a clarification on that Callaway case. 
Okay, next question, number 18. When is a guest considered to be a full-time renter? We have three vehicle limit per condo when guests are staying in a condo much of the time the three vehicle limit may be violated. Is there anything we can do to restrict full-time guests? How would that be enforced? Um, I think on this one, you're gonna wanna reach out to your attorney and talk through, you know, is this like a seasonal guest? Is this like a student that's coming home from college? We'll really wanna look at the facts. If the guest is actually really like living there full-time, like let's say a college student graduates from college, comes back and lives at home with mom and dad. They're there, you know, every night of the week. Um, they're not a guest anymore. They're a resident and they shouldn't be, you know, parking in the guest parking or treated as a guest. Um, so we'll want to look at the facts on that really carefully. Okay, next question, number 19. Can the board enforce removal of plants near a condo and bill the condo owner? Okay, so it sounds like they're, I don't know if the plants are on common areas or if they're on in the you know limited common air elements that the owner may be responsible for exclusively using. Um, so I would need a little bit better information. But if there are plants that have been, you know, installed on the common areas, and sometimes we see owners doing that, um, I think you want to talk with the owner first. Um, just to let them know that, hey, these, why they might be removed. So you don't go into like World War III on this issue um, and kind of try to find some common ground. I don't know if the plants are not being maintained. That's why they need to be removed or maybe they look bad or maybe they shouldn't, the owner went ahead and put them on the common areas without getting approval and it's not consistent with, you know, the rest of the landscaping. I need more facts, but um can the board typically remove something from their common areas? Yes, that's typically our area of responsibility, um, but you wanna be mindful that what's the dynamics are here, how that got there, and is this person gonna be really upset, try to talk it through with them so that we make a good choice. Billing the condo owner to do that, I think that might be a little bit over the top, and you know, unless you have the justification for that in the CCNRs, you probably won't be able to collect that. One thing I want to mention, many, many, many years ago, I had an association where an owner put some chairs on the common areas and the association wanted these chairs removed and the association removed the chairs and then the police got involved and there was a big to do over it saying that the association had stolen the property. Um, so we don't want that to ever happen. So just making that as a little side note here. Um, you know, if you're going to remove an owner's property and you know the owner's property belongs to them, you want to make sure you give it back to them and not like donate it to charity or whatever. I don't know if that would even come into play here with the plants, but um, okay. So next question, number 20 from one of my favorite managers. Good to see you here today. Can amenities be restricted from short-term rental guests? Short answer, probably not because um, tenants would have the same right to use amenities as an owner. Um, that's typically something that's outlined in the CCNRs. Okay, question number 21. We recently held an owner meeting to go over upcoming election ballot measures. We unexpectedly had a quorum of the HOA board at the meeting. The HOA board did not run the meeting. Since the meeting was concerning HOA business, the election, and there was a quorum of the board present, are there meeting requirements to be met in this situation? Note that there were no board discussions or decisions at this meeting. Okay, so just to back this up a little bit. So you're, you're having an owner meeting to discuss an upcoming election ballot. So it's probably like on, you know, an initiative at the association. And we had a quorum of the board at that meeting, but they weren't running it. And there wasn't any decisions being made. Um, it's kind of a dicey, tricky situation because anytime a quorum of the board is present discussing association business, it's considered a board meeting and you need to notice it. So, you know, what would we do in the future, you know, so that somebody doesn't get upset about this and challenge us under the open meeting law for violating the open meeting law? Um, you could call it an owner meeting um, and then do like slash board meeting if you know that the majority of the board is going to be there. Um, and then just put right in the notice, the board's not running this meeting, but there could be a quorum of the board present, and therefore we need to notice this as a board meeting. 
um, that would be the way to handle it or have less than a quorum attend. But if it's an important issue for the community, you probably do want quorum to be there listening. Okay, question number 22. Where is the documentation that 5% of the units turn over yearly in Arizona, making transfer fees lucrative? Um, that is just the feedback. There, there is, I don't have, you know, like a case study that I've done or anything, but that is the feedback that I hear from management companies. Um, and they're the ones that are, you know, collecting the disclosure fee typically. And the boards will, you know, many boards will ask the management company, how much income are you getting from the disclosure fee? And, you know, sometimes the management companies don't readily provide it. So what I will typically say to the board is go back and look at how many sales there have been in your community this year. And when we've gone back and, and done, you know, a check on this, um, we've seen somewhere between five and 10%. There certainly are years when the economy is good or bad, where that may be higher or lower. Um, but I think that's a good range for you to think about if you're trying to plan what sort of revenue you might be getting in from the disclosure fee. Okay, next question, um, number 22, or 23, excuse me. Our management companies have charged transfer fees. We were told to handle the paperwork of the transfer of the property. The management company has been keeping the money. We are not seeing the fees in our accounts. Can you clarify the difference between a transfer fee and a capital contribution fee? Okay, so we talked today about the disclosure fee, right? That's the fee that we... You know, is paid to the association by the buyer or the seller it's negotiated for us disclosing information about the community. Okay, transfer fee and capital contribution fee are typically exactly the same thing. Okay, that's a fee that is being used for a specific purpose for the association. And that may be, you know, to fund the reserve or to, you know, typically it's to fund the reserve or maybe it could be to going to our pool renovation fund or whatever. Um, and so what you need to do is sometimes management companies, they just add on charges to these buyers and no one's really auditing and looking at what these fees are and who they're going to. So I would recommend that you reach out to the key principals of the management company and ask questions like, okay, are we charging a disclosure fee? Who is that going to? How much are we charging? Then are we charging a transfer fee? How much is it? Who is that going to? What is the justification for that? Is it in our CCNRs, um, et cetera, to get a clarification as to what fees are being charged? Okay, question number 24. What does a board resolution mean and how does the board use this mechanism? So great question. Uh, board resolutions are really outdated. I don't like seeing boards using resolutions for a number of reasons. Um, number one, typically they're not in the minutes. And so the board may pass a resolution on something and when the board changes, we can't find it, right? If it's in the minutes, the minutes are the official record of the association. So if the board is making a decision on something, I would 100% prefer that they make the decision and have it in the minutes. And it doesn't need to be called a resolution. Um, resolutions were used in the 80s and 90s, but they really... It's outdated and people aren't using them now. Another reason why I don't like resolutions is sometimes board pass resolutions that conflict with the association's CCNRs. And you can't do that. They can't conflict with the CCNRs. They can't conflict with the bylaws, you know, or the rules. And so it's just an outdated way of doing things. And um, so what does it mean? It's typically a board decision. How does the board use the mechanism? Sometimes they use it just to, you know, codify or to notify the membership that of something, but it's really outdated and, and we don't advise boards ever to use resolutions anymore. Okay, question number 25. If the HOA has never charged a disclosure fee, what is allowed as the initial amount that can be then increased 20% annually up to the $400 max? This is a really good question. So our legislature didn't really think this through, right? In terms of um, you know, what if we haven't ever charged this? Um, because what is, you know, 20% of zero? Um, I think that's zero, right? <laughs> so it doesn't make sense. I can tell you what a lot of associations are doing. They're just charging the 400. I'm not saying that's right. I, I'm going to tell you, I haven't seen any challenges on it um, from a homeowner, seller, or buyer. Um, but most associations, 
in my experience, are just charging the 400. Um, and they, a lot of them really didn't even do the 20% upstep each year. Like I said, I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that the word, the statute wording isn't very good um, because if we weren't charging it, it doesn't really give us an avenue to get there. I suppose what you could do is just set like a, set it at a hundred dollars and then just go up 20% each year. Um, there's no right answer on this. So, um, you know, I, I do think that you can charge the disclosure fee. It's just, there's a question mark as to whether you can just bump it right up to 400. You know, you could be challenged on it. Um, but like I said, in my experience, it's what most associations are doing and they're not being challenged. Okay, next question, number 26. How would the Callaway versus Calabria Ranch case affect an HOA's attempt to amend their CCNRs to add short-term rental restrictions? Um, boy, that is the question of the hour, right? Um, I've been thinking about that since the Callaway case was decided. Okay, um, you know, on the Callaway versus Calabria Ranch case, it was a case that was decided in 2022. It undoubtedly makes it more difficult for associations to amend their CCNRs because the amendment has to be foreseeable, that the owners would, you know, find that this is be something that could be amended in the future. Um, you know, one thing I'm going to say about that case is that it, it had very weird facts, okay? It had like a very small association, like three or four members. And what happened in that case is that a majority of the three or four members teamed up on the fourth member and passed an amendment to the CCNRs without telling that third or fourth member that, that they were amending it. They just went ahead and recorded it after they got the votes. Um, you know, it's a very small association, but the amendment that they passed adversely affected that owner that had no idea about the amendment. And it was really kind of a stinky thing to do, right? And the court didn't like it. And I think that's how we got that bad case law that is having some kind of scary domino ripple effects on our industry. So first things first, you know, you got to talk with your attorney about what do your current documents say about rentals and then look at Callaway and look at your CCNRs again and be like, okay, is this amendment potentially foreseeable? One thing we have to keep in the back of our mind is that in 2016, the legislature told us, if you want to implement a rental restriction, do it via a CCNR amendment, right? Because they took away all the city, towns, and municipalities' ability to regulate short-term rentals. Um, and so, I mean, this industry is like your head spinning because there's so many different things. So, you know... Looking at that law from 2016, where the legislature says, okay, associations, if you want to regulate or you want to prohibit short-term rentals, do an amendment to your CCNRs. Well, that should be kind of foreseeable. That's a law, right? That's telling us to do that if, if we want to respond to the 2016 law, which took away cities, towns, and municipalities' ability to regulate rentals, short-term rentals. So, I mean, the law supports us amending it because the legislature is telling us do that if that's what you want. Now we got this Calabria case that seems to say, well, is it foreseeable? Um, you know, and, and so there's a push and a pull between these two things. After doing this for 25 years, my feeling is I cannot imagine that if this case, the specific issue goes to the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court of Arizona, like how can they justify um, you know, not allowing an association to try to amend the CCNRs to include a rental provision based upon what the legislature has told us to do. And how can they demand that they make it 100% approval? I just, I think that's a tough sell, um, you know, because the legislature is telling us to do this. Um, but again, you know, there's a case in the pipeline that I've been talking about earlier today that may give us further clarification on this. Um, I hope they do. We are still doing rental restriction amendments. We're looking very carefully at what the CCNR say, what the Calgary Ranch says. Sometimes we're grandfathering, using grandfathering so that none of the current owners are suing on it. Um, there's a lot of crafty ways to navigate what the law says about short-term rentals, what Callaway says, 
and what your CC will say. So reach out to an attorney that knows what they're doing on HOA and condo law to talk about this and help you navigate that process. Okay, last question for today um, is what if the president of the association refuses to call an executive board meeting to handle sensitive issues where the president is the focus of the issue? Hmm. Well, that's a problem. But remember, um, state law and I bet your bylaws give the board members a right to call a meeting in addition to the president. So typically what it says is, I mean, I'd have to look at your bylaws, but usually the board president can call a meeting of, of the board or like a majority of the board, other board members can call a meeting of the board. Um, in some cases, it might even be like 25%. I'd have to look specifically at um, what your documents say. But so if you have a five-member board, sometimes two out of the five can call a board meeting or the president can call a board meeting um, or higher number of board members. So I think if you've got that situation, you need to look at what your bylaws say. I bet it has that provision in there. And if you can get another like-minded board member you know, to meet that percentage requirement that you need to call a board meeting, you, you should go ahead and, and ask the president to call it. Now, what if the president refuses to call it, right? Like, I'm not doing that. I'm not setting up a meeting. Well, then the rest of the board should go and meet without the president, properly notice the meeting and discuss the president's behavior. I would hope that the president would want to be there to, you know, give that person's perspective on what's going on. But if they're refusing to and burying their head in the sand, it doesn't mean that you can't go ahead and properly notice that meeting and have a meeting in executive session to discuss it. Okay, so that's it for today. I'm a little bit over. Sorry about that, but this was a, a lot of questions today and we had two really meaty good questions. So a few things to think about as we look ahead to 2023. We have a lot of free learning opportunities ahead on our schedule. Um, make sure that you're checking out our website. Um, MulcahyLawFirm.com. We have a seminar tab or upcoming classes tab right on the homepage of our webpage. We list all of our classes um, on that. Um, I know that we have an in-person class coming up here in Scottsdale on Saturday, January 28th, and I'm going to be there in person. Haven't seen a lot of you in person in a long time, so I hope you'll be coming. Um, it's on Saturday, January 28th. Um, it's an HOA condominium symposium from 9.30 to 1.30 p.m. Um, the city of Scottsdale is putting it on. I know that there are a limited number of people that are allowed to attend based upon the room requirements. So if you're interested in registering for that, you want to make sure that you um, go to our website right away, um, mulcahylawfirm.com, and click on the link to register. Um, we also have a number of other classes coming up, um, and we have them all listed on our website. So we're, throughout 2023, we're going to continue doing our first Friday free call-in. That information is on our website. Um, we also are going to have our virtual um, HOA and condo uh, academy that we're going to be doing in conjunction with all the different cities throughout the valley um, to provide free education to you. Um, and that's always going to be the third Thursday of the month. Um, at 11 a.m. So we'll be continuing to do that. And then there'll be some other special classes that we'll do um, throughout the year as well. So just some, you know, concluding remarks on today, we had 70 live viewers on Zoom and many others joining us also on Facebook Live. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for caring about your community and wanting to make it better um, and wanting to learn about the law so that you make good decisions um, as you're navigating your time on the board or as you're living in your community or as, as you're helping boards as a manager. Um, we are going to be, our next official virtual seminar is going to be on Friday, February 3rd at 9 a.m. for our firm's February virtual first Friday free call-in where we're gonna answer questions for free. Um, and we're also gonna be joining you again on Tuesday, February 21st for class number two of our virtual HOA Condo Academy. And the topic for that class is going to be how to run effective board meetings and annual meetings. Um, that's always a, a really good class because we teach you the study so that you can have an annual meeting and give you the tools so that you can have um, efficient one-hour board meetings and get a lot of things done. Um, so we hope you will join us for our upcoming classes. And thank you again for joining us here today and making our classes that we do virtually a success. 
Um, we look forward to 2023. We hope your associations are successful in 2023. And we want you to know that we're here to help support you and answer your questions as you navigate your time serving on the board in an association or living in an association or helping manage an association. So thank you again. And I look forward to seeing you virtually again in February. Take care.